Join us at sleepapnea.org to be included in the conversation and updated whenever new programs are available. Thanks for joining us and enjoy. Hello, everybody. Thank you so much for joining sleepapnea.org for this Sleep Timber speaker series. This is our sixth annual Sleep Timber uh, month, and we are focusing on co occurring conditions. In 2018, we did a patient survey, and um, 20% of the respondents to that survey said that they had both sleep apnea and diabetes. So I am happy to have here today with us to talk about apnea and diabetes and these co-occurring conditions. Uh, please welcome Lisa Graham, who is a registered mm -hmm. nurse as well as a certified diabetes care and education specialist. Thank you, Lisa. We Thank have you. Kim Samford, who is a diabetes and sleep apnea patient. Hi, Kim. Happy to have you here today. And then we have Teresa Schumard, who is part of our sleepapnea.org team. She is a board member and our wake community leader. We're happy to have all of you here with us today to talk about sleep apnea and diabetes. Thank you. Um, let's kick it off by hearing uh, from Kim, from a patient perspective, a little bit about her journey. Uh, uh, what came first? Was it your apnea diagnosis, your diabetes diagnosis? And kind of walk us through those, those two um, conditions that you have. Well, as nurses, the diabetes came first. And I suspect the sleep apnea may have been there first. Um, I was having symptoms. I just didn't go get tested because I didn't I didn't think I would have sleep apnea. <laughs> and in 2016, I went to a new doctor, so he ordered all the blood work and it came back um, showing that my A1C was very high. Um, so I started some medication for diabetes. And about a year later, my husband told me that I was actually keeping him awake at night because one snoring and the other, I would stop breathing. And he said I had been doing that for quite some time. So I talked to my doctor about it and he suggested I go see a, a sleep doctor, which I did. And the first night that I went up and stayed with all the wires. <laughs> um, it showed that I, I was having, I believe it was 19 episodes per hour. And so they had me come back and sleep with the CPAP on. And I couldn't believe how much better I slept that night than I had in years. Even being in a strange place, I, the sleep was so much better. I couldn't mm -hmm. believe it. Yeah, so I've yeah. Been using my CPAP ever since. Great, I still have great. That I can't sleep. Um, get is much sleep. Mm -hmm. Understand. Okay. So, um, before uh, your diabetes uh, diagnosis, did you? What kind of symptoms were you having? Did you? You know, was it a slow lead into getting that, or did it just you know happen all of a sudden? And and one day your doctor told you this. The diabetes diagnosis. Yes. Yes. I had been having extreme fatigue. I would tell my husband, "I'm so tired. I don't feel like I can." Walk walk across the room. I guess I had gotten used to the not getting good sleep because it had gone on for so long. The, the extreme fatigue was having um, very dry mouth, water all the time. Um, it's really the only symptoms that I can relate. And at the time, I didn't relate it to diabetes because I had no idea that mm -hmm. I could have diabetes. <laughs> Yeah, yeah. So, Lisa, let's bring you into the conversation here. Um, you know, we in the sleep apnea community, uh, we often talk about, you know, being very tired during the day, having that kind of chronic fatigue. Um, but it sounds that it might be it's it's similar yet different when you're looking at the two when you when you bring in the diabetes aspect of it. 
Yes. And, you know, I saw that you asked him in regards to um, symptoms. Many times with diabetes are early on. Many people have no symptoms. Um, but when you have blood sugars that have gotten to a very high level, that is that sometimes the symptoms that can spoke of that we may have where people feel extremely tired, uh, of course, extreme thirst. Um, um, sometimes that leads to, of course, urination. And that's just, again, how the body, of course, is working. A lot of times they're so tired because um, if it, just a little bit back in regards to diabetes, of course, diabetes means blood sugars are too high. Um, and a lot of times what controls those blood sugars are carbohydrates, the amount of, of course, carbs, sugars, of course, which carbs turn into sugar that we, of course, take in. So when you have an individual that has diabetes, the insulin in their body that's helping to move sugar that they've taken in from their bloodstream to getting it to their cells is not working the way it's supposed to. Sometimes it's not available at all. So when you have these carbohydrates, which are the... Um, fuel source for the body. They give the body energy. So when I have those carbohydrates that can't get out of, of course, my bloodstream and get into my cells, that, of course, makes me tired because I don't have any energy. I can't get the, the of course, that energy. So oftentimes that people do speak of being very tired because that insulin not working to move the sugar to that, um, to the cells, then people don't lack, of course, that energy. And of course, with uh, sleep apnea, that lack of energy comes from not being getting a good night's, of course, sleep. So that's, in a sense, that correlation between that tiredness um, with people with diabetes not being able to get the sugar inside the cell so they can use that energy. And then, of course, with sleep and apnea, not just getting the rest. Um, and so their bodies haven't had the opportunity, in a sense, to recover. Yeah. You know, one of the things that we've been talking about this month with uh, all of these co-occurring conditions, you know, we spoke about high blood pressure, we spoke about GERD, we talked about brain function last week, and now we're talking about diabetes, that, you know, there it's it's sometimes difficult for patients to figure out because, you know, there there are so many symptoms that you know, mirror other conditions, Absolutely. just like you're Absolutely. saying. So it, mm -hmm. it makes it a little bit, you know, confusing. You think you have it under control with your diabetes, but then, you know, here you go, find out a couple of years later, you also have sleep, you know, sleep apnea. And, mm -hmm. um, you know, do you, do you talk a lot with your, when, when you're going through your diabetes education, do you, do you talk with your patients about sleep and, and, and kind of part, having that be part of total wellness with an individual? Absolutely. Um, we look at, we know, and I think that the, the studies that we've done is that shows how important sleep is. And of course, sleep apnea is one condition, but you know, we have, of course, insomnia and other um, problems why people can't sleep. But I definitely, it is a part of um, my educational classes because sleep pays such a large part just with, we have one of the biggest concerns, of course, with people with diabetes is um, sometimes being overweight. Um, and we know that how important it is with losing that weight um, to help improve their blood sugar numbers. And we know that that plays a part, of course, with those who have also been uh, diagnosed with sleep apnea. So I talked to them about the importance of sleep and how the lack of sleep can actually contribute to, you know, elevating their blood sugar numbers and just overall better management of those numbers so that we're preventing, of course, long term uh, or delaying long term complications. Yeah. Um, Kim, if I if I can go back to you just for a minute. Um, I know previously when when we spoke, you know, you and you just said here about, you know, your husband kind of bringing you to your sleep apnea uh, diagnosis and how much better you felt. But you also did mention to me at one time that is your your husband's on a CPAP machine now, too. Correct. Yes. 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 Yeah. And how how did he come about his diagnosis? I believe his doctor suggested it. He, um, it's been so long ago, I've forgotten for sure, but I believe it was just because he wasn't sleeping good and was tired all the time. He talked with his doctor about that and he suggested mm -hmm. that he could test a study. 
Because he was very in tune to, you know, you know, your sleeping habits of, I think, you know, snoring and, and you know, witnessing yeah. you holding your breath. Um, you know, I was wondering if he kind of, you know, then l- looked at himself and having those same things, too, because, you know, a lot of the pro- a lot of uh, what happens with our community is, you know, they're individuals that aren't yet diagnosed. Um, you know, you're sleeping. You don't, you don't know what you're doing. <laughs> and so sometimes they don't really believe what's happening or want to believe or, you know, and, and all of that comes into play. So, you know, uh, any bed partner or, or family that you sleep with, you know, that has a concern and has witnessed you snoring and holding your breath, it's definitely something to, you know, for sure go and seek your doctor about because it is a serious matter. And just like Lisa said, you know, uh, affects your overall health and wellness. Um, let's bring Teresa into into the uh, conversation here. Let's talk a little bit about you know your history with uh, with sleep apnea, not only being a patient but also a um, you know working in um, the clinic, and then also diabetes patient as well. Yes, um, I was working the night shift, classic uh, shift worker. Tales of woe. Uh, you never get enough sleep. You you learn to sleep when you can. And I think that that sort of carried me over. When I started having all these symptoms, I just had trained myself sleep when you can. And so it got ridiculous, though. It got It got to the point where I was sleeping every time I would get in the car as a passenger, not as a driver. Um, let me clarify that. Um, and I, my husband and I were driving from Texas back to Pennsylvania, and every time I would get in the the seat, I was asleep before we got to the interstate. And I said, "What is wrong? You know, I guess I'm just really bored." But that's not like me. You know, I would want to see what what I was seeing. I love road trips. And I could not stay awake. I could not stay awake at home, even when we were still at my in laws. I could not stay awake. And every afternoon, I just would go back in a quiet spot and just. It didn't have to be a quiet spot. It could be anywhere. I couldn't walk across the room without feeling like I was going to pass out or what have you. And I just started having these swings. And sometimes I thought, why am I so dizzy? What's going on with that? And so I would get dizzy or I would get, then I would start to get nervous, like ultra nervous. And now I realize what was happening. My sugar was dropping. It was so used to being high. Mm-hmm. And here I would have a, a low moment and I would start trembling, like like trembling. And so I didn't know what to do. So I would take a little thimble uh, a shot glass of wine because I thought, well, that'll calm me. But it's not like really drinking, you know. <laughs> and so it, right away I would feel better. So I'm telling this story to my doctor. And they're they're writing this. You know, I'm, I'm at an internist now. I've just been with a, a general practitioner before that. And uh, he said, we think you have diabetes. And I was like, oh, come on. You know, I, I, you know, I don't have any symptoms. He says, yes, you do. You are so fatigued and your mouth is dry and you're having these highs and lows. And now you're drinking the wine. And, and there you go. And I was like, no way. I didn't believe him. And they took the test and she, oh, I was really bad diabetic. I mean, me, super bad. <laughs> let, let me just interject here and ask Lisa to to talk a little bit about, you know, blood sugar being, you know, just like Teresa said, there's the, the, there's there's the high range and then there's a the low range. Are, the, are those um, what you're experiencing? Are they the same? Do you feel the same? You know, is when the same when it's low and then it's high or is it different? Well, some of it, I think, like you said, Justine, that's the challenge, of course, a lot of times with a lot of these symptoms, because these symptoms do mirror symptoms of other conditions. Um, You know, we spoke about, of course, the the feeling tired, and that's because, of course, sugar is not moving from the bloodstream, getting into the cells, and this feeling in a sense of this thirst, and um, a lot of times, usually thirst goes with going to the restroom. Well, that's, of course, uh, and the thirst 
it, it kind of won, you know, who is what came first, they said the chicken or the egg. But um, again, a lot of times that's because the body, there's so much sugar in the bloodstream and the body's trying to get rid of that. So it makes you go to the bathroom. Well, now I'm going to the bathroom. I need to drink because I keep going to the bathroom. So so those are again, it's it's the 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 body in a sense trying to correct itself. I tell people the body's an amazing instrument. It has all of these kind of fail safes in regards to something's not going right. And when you have, of course, a low and high, of course, blood sugar, some symptoms are the same. Um, when we talk about, of course, low blood sugar, that's because there's no sugar in those cells. So the body's like, what is what is going on? So like you're saying, the shakiness that I feel, irritability, uh, but, you know, also I can feel tired sometimes then as well. Uh, but I also feel that on the other side, because now, again, the same thing is happening. There's not sugars not getting into the cell where the body can use it. So some things are classic in regards to high, and that's where... Um, like we talked about the uh, feeling hungry sometimes, the sleepy, but we also feel that on the low, of course, side, because it's still kind of dealing with the same issue. It's just that, like I said, we don't have the sugar in the cells where the body can um, can use it. And so I always tell people with diabetes, that's why it's so important that we stop and we check blood sugars if we can. Sometimes if you drop too low, um, I just need to get in something really quick because I just don't have the time to, of course, you know, get the monitor out and do all that. But you want to see what you're dealing with because sometimes these symptoms may have nothing to do with diabetes. So what I'm feeling, it really really may be something else that's going on. So once I am able to check my blood sugar, I'm able to see, is it, of course, is it high that I'm, I'm okay? What do I need to do there? Or is it low? Because what we can also do is take something when it's high because I think it's low and now I've made it even higher. So if we have an opportunity, it's always a good idea to stop and check your blood sugar to really see what am I dealing with? Because what you're feeling may not have anything to do with your diabetes. Right. Teresa, talk a little bit about you, you know, you started off talking about your uh, shift work mm -hmm. and, you know, so talk a little bit about that and how you were managing that between your sleep and, you know, a big part of diabetes, as, as Lisa is discussing, is, you know, uh, uh, managing your blood sugar, which is food consumption, what you're drinking, what you're eating, um, when you're taking your medicine, all of those kinds. How, how was that whole thing, especially since you had a shift work aspect to it? I imagine it was difficult. Um, it was so impossible to know what to do when, especially when I started having the, the diabetes symptoms that I didn't, I mean, I must have had them for a long time before it actually, I probably had the pre-diabetes. I probably went through the whole gamut of, you know, the scenario, but um, I was just having to eat what I could when I, you know, it's just sort of, you don't have time to really cook, you know, all the other responsibilities. So you grab whatever is, you know, leftover or whatever, and just eat at inappropriate times when the, uh, you know, metabolism is way off when you're up working. Uh, I was actually, I actually worked in a sleep lab. So I was watching other people sleep and have sleep apnea. So I was very in tune to the brain and what the lung functions were, but nobody ever told me about the pancreas. <laughs> so mm -hmm. I wasn't paying any attention to those mm -hmm. signals. I had all the signals, all the signals. If I had just known, but I didn't know. And, and I'm an educated woman. I'm a medical professional. And I did not know the symptoms. And I thought, why didn't the CDC have something out about this? Why did I not know? I mean, it should have been right in my face, but it wasn't. But I think things are going to get better. I think that we're going to keep talking about it and keep the yeah. conversation going. Mm -hmm. yeah. And thank God we have people like like uh, Lisa that can guide people. We don't have that education with our sleep patients. They don't get to, you know, I felt very bad about having a patient in front of me hooking electrodes on their head. And then I would have to tell them everything that I knew about sleep problems in an hour. 
you know, and, and while they're getting all this done to them, that's not fair. They're overwhelmed. I'm doing all this stuff to them and I'm trying to squeeze in 20 years of education, you know, and it's not working. So hopefully, hopefully we come to the day that I hope I see the day when we actually have that, that reimbursement by payers for sleep apnea education. Yeah. Let me ask Kim, um, do, can you talk a little bit about, you know, uh, your education once you got diagnosed with sleep apnea? Uh, you know, did you get it from the uh, durable medical equipment company, you know, who gave you your machine or was it in the doctor's office or not really at all? And, or maybe you remember what your husband kind of went through that, you know, that patient education. Can, can you talk about that for, for a few moments? Yes. Education as far as using the CPAP machine came from the place where I received the machine from. Uh, and it was really good. Um, a girl sat with me for probably 30 to 45 minutes. She went over everything, even cleaning, you know, how often to clean, how important it was to um, get new supplies when when it was time and not try to use old stuff. Um, she went over it real thoroughly. Uh, but it did come from the place where I picked my machine up. Then I did go back to um, the doctor's office for a follow-up after, I believe it was a couple or three months after I started using the CPAP, just to see how I was doing. Okay. Okay. Well, I'm I'm glad to hear that you know you had um, some hand holding in the beginning um, because it you know again I kind of ref I referenced that survey that we had a couple of years ago and that was definitely one of the places that most of the our patient respondents said that you know they really didn't have a lot of guidance you know maybe you know maybe they did get a little twenty minutes on here's how the machine works in this and then they hit a hurdle they hit a hurdle of, you know, this is leaking in my eyes, it's blowing air here, I, you know, this is really uncomfortable on my nose, all of these things that happen with the mask and the humidity and the machine, and there just wasn't a resource. I mean, that's definitely, that was something that was, you know, uh, reported a significant amount on, uh, on the report. Um, Lisa, why don't you talk to us a little bit about, um, you know, when when you're a diabetes patient and you immediately get diagnosed, you're in the doctor's office, right? And they have your test results there and they say, okay, you have this. What happens next? What I mean, you can't leave without some sort of... Uh, medicine or or prescription or or plan that's really going to you know uh, uh, manage it for you, correct? Yes, absolutely. And I think I just want to echo a little bit what um, Teresa was saying in regards to the importance of education. I think education and of course prevention. Um, I, I just don't think that we focus a lot, of course, on prevention and of course educating the pub public, especially when we're talking about conditions um, that. We we can do something about in our lifestyle can make a difference, of course, there. But unfortunately, what's happening a lot of times when you have patients, and I have tons of patients, of course, that have actually find me on the internet because they didn't get good guidance, of course, from their doctors. So a lot of times um, they, are, they are told, of course, once they have it, maybe walking into the office or a phone call that says that their A1C is elevated and, and now that they are diabetic and in really, I've had patients say to me, the doctor says, Google it. I just had a patient that just entered uh, one of my programs that um, said that they told her to find an old Weight Watchers diet and, and follow it. Um, and so, again, we're, we're dealing with sometimes on the side of the practitioners or them just not knowing, of course, of resources that are out there. Of course, not um, actually having sometimes educators within their, um, you know, their offices, but even them being able to say, I don't know, but let me refer you here. But right now, um, the CDC 
um, as well as uh, my professional organization, um, which is the Association of Diabetes Care and Education Specialists. We're really pushing and pushing information out there to get to physicians because they can't get to me if they don't know about, of course, me. So a lot of times the people that that come to me are that they wanted to find out more information. Um, so they're really doing huge uh, promotion to, of course, um, primary care, of course, physicians, because that's who sees the, the of course, these new diagnoses is to talk about the importance, of course, of um, education. So w- we know how vital, as, as they've just talked about, Teresa, of course, and Kim here, in regards to having that just with sleep apnea. But diabetes is something we truly can do something about. So if we can get people into education, it really can truly make a difference, of course, in their, you know, just their, you know, their life you know, span goals, all of that, uh, if they receive that, that education. Yeah. Teresa, did you, did you want to make a comment? Well, I just think about all the body systems that I have wrecked because mm-hmm. I was not in tune with the, uh, Number one, I I did know the risk factors. That much I knew from books. But in front of my face, I didn't know the symptoms. That was was the sad part because I am a very good patient. If the doctor says you do this, you do this, I do it, you know. And so, in fact, I was (laughs) – my my little doctor, he's – He's, he's, I have shoes older than he is, but he's so wise, wise beyond his years. And he says to me, Teresa, you know, you're doing fine. He said, but he said, how did you do this? You've only been, you know, three or four months diagnosed and you've already cut your number in half. How did you do that? I said, cause I'm obsessed with staying alive, <laughs> you know? <laughs> and I, I said, I had a grapefruit every day and I had, you know, I just didn't eat sugar and I didn't. You know, I, I just paid attention to what I was. And he said, well, tell everybody in the uh, waiting room what you did. <laughs> so, I was kind of, you know, uh, but it, it doesn't stay. It didn't stay that way. I, I have to say I fell off the wagon a few times. It's like any <laughs> other thing. You know, I have a sugar addiction. So, yeah. I, I just wanted to uh, make a point with what, you know, Lisa said. Um, it, it, it's similar uh, in regards to sleep apnea, uh, how you said that sometimes the physicians aren't aware of the resources that are available. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Well, um, you know, sometimes, uh, you know, from, from, from talking to our community and our patients, you know, sometimes, you know, depending on what door they walk into, they don't, they don't ever hear about the sleep. So they never mm-hmm. factor it in. So it's, mm-hmm. you know, it's, it's on parallel tracks there. Do you know what I yes. mean? Like yes, you know, exactly. the doctor isn't aware of this education being over there uh, available to these diabetes patients and, and, you know, and doctors aren't factoring in um, the, the the sleep component into the you know, overall health of the individual. And, you know, if, just like we said earlier, you know, if your sleep is really uh, interrupted, if you're, you're not breathing, you're holding on to CO2, all of these mm-hmm. things are happening. You know, if you have other conditions going on, it's not going to help them very much. <laughs> you know, I mean, Absolutely. it's not going to create yeah. an environment where, oh, I'll be able to get my diabetes under control mm-hmm. or my reflux or my high mm-hmm. blood pressure. It's just mm-hmm. going to be, you know, a uh, 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 difficult uh, for, yes. you know. And if I might add, Justine, I think that when we think good sleep is at the core of overall health. I think that we we have to make sure that we are getting, of course, rest to the best, of course, of our ability. And and like I said, with diabetes patients, that is something that I always I touch on. And it's it's the 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 stress, of course, of the lack of sleep on the body that causes those numbers to, of course, go up. And the key thing, of course, with diabetes is us keeping those numbers under control so that we're preventing or delaying the potential complications of diabetes because diabetes is a progressive disease. So we want to get this under control. And I think, as, as Kim said, and of course, and Teresa, the other challenge, of course, in this area of sleep apnea is that people are undiagnosed. 
we all have, and I didn't mention earlier, but my husband, who is a type one diabetic, who has been um, diagnosed with sleep apnea, and for years I tried, and we know, and no offense, of course, to the men out there, but we know sometimes <laughs> how it can be a challenge, of course, getting them in, because I, I knew that it was a problem, but it was a challenge getting him there to say, we need to do this sleep study, because they don't want to take time to do that. Um, but clearly, we, we did see a huge difference just in his overall, um, you know, how he felt, of course, after, of course, being put on that CPAP machine. So it's, it's convincing them sometimes that I know you don't want to do this. It's the same thing. Like he's an, he's a type one. So he wears an insulin pump for years. I tried to get him to wear an insulin pump. I'm not going to do that. I want to, and after he got on it and he did, he's like, Oh my gosh, I should have done this years ago. So sometimes if we can get them there and just kind of let them see, Hey, how much different your life could be if I get this CPAP machine, if I, you know, get my numbers under control, because they, they're just thinking sometimes that this is where they have to be. But there are these things with modern medicine that have, you know, really helped us to improve how we manage so many of these conditions. Yeah. Teresa, did you want to say something? Did you raise your I hand? I do. I do. She was, she was <laughs> talking <laughs> my religion. Uh, <laughs> we are all strong women here. And yes, in the spirit yes. of God bless her, our little Ruth uh, Bader Ginsburg, losing yes. her at this yes. time. Yes. I I, yes. I think, you know, you're right. I mean, you 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 pushed for your husband. You you cared mm-hmm. for your husband. You mm-hmm. You know, I think... So many men are alive mm-hmm. today because the wife had the elbow yeah. and yeah. had that, mm-hmm. you know, had that, uh, you know, determination to make mm-hmm. him see. And you can't always be so direct. You know, yeah. you have to work with what you have and, yeah, you know, absolutely. trying to convince them because you love them. Mm-hmm. I had the same experience. Um, yeah. My husband would listen. I mean, I'm a sleep technician, you know, yeah. and he wouldn't listen to me. And I was frustrated. Yeah. It, it was, it was, it was the American Sleep Apnea Association that did it for him, actually. Yeah. So. I was going to say, <laughs> <"Hey."> <laughs> like he heard my colleagues talking about it. And then he was like, oh, okay. Yes. Yeah. He wasn't kidding. Mm-hmm. You know? <laughs> right. Absolutely. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> Go women. <laughs> yes. yes. Well, I, one, one, thing, one thing I want to talk about that, that Lisa brought up is um, – kind of that 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 uh, prevention you know that you know paying attention to your overall wellness and mm-hmm. you know things uh, things you know run in families conditions run in families heredit- hereditary lifestyle choices you know all, all those things and you know one of the things here at sleepapnea.org uh, that we like to talk about is um, pediatrics I mean mm-hmm. it's you know it, it is a it is a topic for us that you know is near and dear to my heart because mm-hmm. my husband was diagnosed with severe sleep apnea and then um, you know in taking him to the doctor and so forth then I found out that my daughter had that which um, you know we talked a lot about um, you know uh, uh, frequent urination with with mm-hmm. diabetes and the, and the and the thirst aspect and I always like to you know get this out there when I can one of the most surprising things that the doctor said to me uh, Dr. Christian Gimeno said to me from Stanford um, about children was you know, chronic bedwetting is something to really look at because, you know, if if your child is having fragmented sleep and having all of these mm-hmm. disruptions, whether they're actually mm-hmm. waking up or not, yes. um, you know, all these chemicals get released in your body and it makes you have yes. to go to the bathroom. Mm-hmm. And then, you know, mm-hmm. and then the four-year-old, you know, has an accident. The six-year-old yes. has an accident. Mm-hmm. So, you know, just, I mean, it's, it, it just circles around to what we were talking about that, you know, everything is intertwined. Everything is not mm-hmm. always siloed and Absolutely. and everyone needs to look for those um, education options, you know, like like from yourself or from our mm-hmm. organization mm-hmm. You know, to try to be, a, you know, an advocate for yourself and, you know, and your family. Um, you know, I, I think that that's really, really important because, you know, from our standpoint, and I'll let you speak a little bit to to the progression of, of diabetes, but, you know, if you find these um 
uh, if you are able to identify the the, the sleep issues uh, in, in in children in pediatrics, especially because sleep apnea can run in families, we've talked about it here with with uh, uh, sleepapnea.org before. You know, there are things that you can do to mitigate that. So yes. when your child is in their uh, you know thirties, forties, maybe they don't need a CPAP then. I mean, yes. they might need it later on in life mm-hmm. because mm-hmm. your body's ever changing and tissues Absolutely. ever getting softer mm-hmm. yes. <laughs> but um but i think that that you know is really important um yes. why don't you talk for a minute just about the progression of diabetes because to be quite honest i'm not sure if i if i even know a lot about uh, that part yeah so so again and i think you're so right just on family just of course in general and overall family family health and and again just getting to the doctor getting for those checkups and and bringing the, the those you know different symptoms and things to their attention but in regards to progression um um like i said that at this time once a person is diagnosed with with diabetes um unfortunately there is no cure for diabetes then we do know in the case of a person with type 2 diabetes there's a, p- a point where they can, um, what we like to say, you know, people say reverse diabetes, but we we more like in, in regards to saying that it's in remission or went dormant, because typically when you have people that, um, of course, have, they don't need to take medicine anymore, their numbers have gone down tremendously, it's usually because they've done something, they've lost weight, they, you know, improved their diet, doing exercise, and of course, because of that, their numbers are going down, but if they stop doing that, those numbers are going up. So when we look at the progression, it's, it's really in the sense people can live, first of all, I want to say, people can live long, healthy lives with diabetes. But the key is keeping blood sugars under control because what what in a sense causes a lot of the complications are elevated blood sugars. So these elevated blood sugar damage, of course, you know, blood vessels and various organs uh, because of these higher numbers. And then that's when that, of course, leads to eye, you know, problems with your eyes, problems with your heart, you know, your kidneys, um, circulatory problems. All of these are, are um, in response to elevated numbers. But we see if we keep numbers within the range and pretty much when we look with people with diabetes in the mornings, we want them 80, of course, to uh, 130, two hours after a meal, anytime throughout the day, we want them 80 to 180. So the American Diabetes Association, they've studied people for years and we see if we keep them in these ranges. And we've talked a lot too now about time in range so that most of the time they're in that range as opposed to just looking at that A1C as a measurement. So the more time that they're in range, the the less damage that's going on to their, you know, blood vessels and, of course, these other organs. So the progression just looks at if we're not controlling it, it's things are going to get progressively worse. But if we control it, then, of course, that, like as I said, that people can live long, healthy, of course, lives. It sounds to me, Teresa, uh, after after listening to to Lisa there, that you know apnea and uh, diabetes are like uh, are sisters because it's the yeah. same thing. You don't treat your diabetes. I mean, excuse me, you don't treat your apnea for a number of years because you know maybe it's maybe you're in your thirties and you could just plow through the tiredness and you can you know go just continue on and and whatever and and then all of a sudden it just hits you like a like a a, a, a Mac truck that I, you know, I can't function anymore. I'm so tired. What's going on? And it's been your sleep progressively mm-hmm. all of those years, you know, just kind of as, as you're speaking to it there. Mm-hmm. Well, I just want to thank everybody for the, for sharing your stories and giving this great information today. I'm going to kind of go around and just give any last minute thoughts or advice. And, and if, uh, I'll lead off with uh, Teresa and then go to Kim. Teresa, do you have any Parting, parting little thoughts uh, bef- uh, before we before we wrap it up here. Yes, um, before I had mentioned that as a sleep professional, I was trained to sleep when I could, and when diabetes came into my life, I realized that not only did I have to treat my sleep apnea, but I had to be careful to get enough sleep for the diabetes. It took. An average of an extra hour and a half for me to feel okay. And I feel, you know, and keep my numbers where they're supposed to be. But that shifted 
although my sleep apnea was treated and all that. So I, I say to people, don't be surprised if you have to sleep a little bit longer, mm-hmm. you know, whatever that looks like for you. Yeah, yeah. Kim, do you have anything you'd like to say before, before we go to Lisa? To probably encourage people if they are having trouble sleeping. The, yeah, it's a pain to have to go sleep at the sleep study a couple of nights, but it is so worth it. And wearing the mask at night or the you have to wear, it does take some getting used to. But the sleep is so much better, and it's so worth it. My my uh, office told me they wished I would sit in their wedding room and, and be the cheerleader for <laughs> the sleep <laughs> um, yeah. that machine because I had such right. good results with it. But it's so worth it. It does take some getting used to, and it is hard, and it's a pain, but it's really worth it to get that good sleep. Yeah. Why? Thank you so much. Thank you, Teresa and Kim, for you know for sharing your stories because that's what you know our organization is all about. I mean, and I think you know I'll, I'll go to Lisa one last time before we wrap up. But I, I think you can attest that patient sharing stories, being truthful and honest about Absolutely. the good, the bad, the struggles. I like this. I don't like this. I mean, you know, um, uh, I'm sure there's a lot of things out there for you know various types of digital things for for diabetics and all this kind of stuff you know you're still using devices like like we are and yeah. you know people can can help each other help each other with them mm-hmm. you know so. Absolutely. Absolutely. Well, I first want to commend you all for, for just doing this and, and listening, um, because oftentimes we, we, we're not listening, of course, to our patients, our um, you know participants or, or, or whoever. So uh, providing this, of course, platform for them to get more information. And then I think it is important, as you said, and what I say to people who leave my classes is that I see them as ambassadors because I say to them is that you will go places I never will go. You will go. You will you will see people or meet people I never will meet. And my and the important thing is that you share the information that you've had here. So, of course, Teresa and him sharing their stories because those stories are valuable. Um, they see me as the expert. And, you know, that's why I often tell my stories of my husband being a type one. My daughter, of course, I didn't share that, but being a type two, because that is so important. And one of the things that um, I just, I always leave people is you have to take care of you. Um, again, sometimes this leans on women a little bit more to, you know, we, we tend to take care of everyone else and don't take care of ourselves. Mm-hmm. But men, on the, the other hand, too, they're they're working, bread, all of those things, as you mentioned, Justine, in our younger years, just, uh, of course, just going after and, you know, just pushing through it. But take care of your body. Your body gives you many, many signs. And if you listen, um, and, and of course, that it will definitely pay off in the end. And hopefully we can prevent something before it gets to a, a point that there may not be you know much we can do so listen to your bodies um and they will not you know of course fail you exactly exactly (laughs) thank you ladies all so much for your time today we're so happy to have you as part of this sleep timber event and um you know raising awareness for these co-occurring conditions that are happening with apnea we have one more uh sleep timber speaker series next tuesday same time same place tuesday at three o'clock eastern and we're going to wrap up the the whole month with with a great group of sleepapnea.org team members and some special uh experts uh, from the uh, NYU Health Disparities team. So we are looking forward um, to having them. And thank you all so much for joining us and have a wonderful afternoon. All right. Thank you very much. Bye. Thank you. Thank you for joining us today. Be an awake angel and you can help those financially impacted by COVID-19. Just $50 can provide two CPAP masks to someone in need. Please visit sleepapnea.org slash donate for details. The ASAA is a patient-focused organization. Please like and subscribe to our YouTube page, join us on Facebook, Twitter, Instagram, or sleepapnea.org and you can join the conversation. It's all free.